the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> the word of God for this morning is the gospel lesson in Mark 13, which you have already heard. <clears throat> Today I want to tell you, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I want to tell you about a very special place, a place that goes a long way back and in history. Now that history gets a little bit involved, so I ask you to just bear with me and try to follow along with what I'm saying here. Anyway, I'm going to quiz you when I'm done anyway, so you would do well to, to listen well the, the first time. But I want to tell you about a special place that goes way back in history. There's evidence from ancient pottery that this place was known about as far back as 3000 BC, which is getting close to the time of Noah. Egypt, the records show, knew about this place as, as re early as 1900 BC. And it's a place that was known to Joshua when he conquered the promised land in the first place. And of course, Joshua was the sidekick of Moses and, and became Moses' immediate successor. <clears throat> now this place that I'm talking about is something that would be highly prized in the ancient world uh, for two reasons. One was that um, it was a mountain which would be good for defending the city. Now by a mountain I mean they had an elevation of about 25 hundred feet. Now that's a mountain in Florida, but I don't think that's a mountain in Colorado. <clears throat> but uh, the second thing that makes us a prized piece is there is a handy source of water, either a spring or a creek, and with the water close by if they were besieged and surrounded, they would at least have water uh, to drink. <clears throat> so that made this very uh, popular sort of place. Now, this place was a part of Canaan. And you know Canaan is the land that God promised. Yes, the promised land. And God's people, if they would trust him, could lay claim to that, that uh, piece of land at any time. Now by Joshua's time, the, the city in question here, or the place I should say, was inhabited by people called Jebusites. Now they were, they were pretty weird. They engaged in things like uh, snake worship. Any snake worshipers here? Oh, are you raising your hand? No, oh no. <laughs> And another thing that they engaged in was child sacrifice. Can you imagine killing your own child for your own convenience? Oh, well, we have clinics for that, do we not? Now this uh, hill of the Jebusite sites was, was hard to conquer. In fact, David couldn't conquer this place until after 1000 BC. And David, it took him three times before he could actually capture the city. Three times. And I know what was going on here. A city would have uh, basically buildings made of stones, individual stones that were held together by the law of gravity. And when a foreign country came into a city, yeah, it wasn't that hard. You know, you didn't want to fight the inhabitants because you might get hurt yourself, you know. So they go through the city and uh, tear all the stones down and make a pile of rubble and then leave. And the citizens would come out from wherever they were hiding and they, well, it's time to do this again. And what would they do? They'd put their city back together again. And so they went through this three times with David and finally uh, they, they had had it. 
Now this place, as I have hinted already, was a city. It means the foundation of peace. And I think you can guess what city that is. Anyone want to guess? I, I hear an answer, but uh, that's Jerusalem. The city is Jerusalem, the mount is Mount Zion, and the water source, that's easy, that's a little bit more obscure, but it was the spring Gihon, as it was known, and from that spring outside, a tunnel was bored under the city wall, and the water collected in the pool of Siloam, just inside the wall, and the pool of Siloam was where Jesus performed many of his uh, miracles. Now David, of course, loved this city. And when we say city of David, we're not talking about Jerusalem, are we? What are we talking about? Bethlehem. We're talking about Bethlehem. But this too was David's city. He defended it several times. He sent his people out to war against the enemy, the most famous of which being Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. The city got pretty well developed, but the greatest part of the city of Jerusalem was yet to be made. David had brought the Ark of the Covenant into, the, into Jerusalem, but he had it in a temporary quarters, a tent, uh, and that was not befitting, he thought, the Ark of the Covenant. So he determined that a permanent house for the presence of God, the ark, would have to be built. And yet David was not allowed to do it. And so his son Solomon was going to build that temple. And that temple became one of the wonders of the ancient world. The estimated, um, estimated value of, of uh, that building in today's dollars would be about I'm told 15 trillion dollars to build it, which is equal to one week's work in Washington. And, uh, but ah, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. God consented to live there. By his grace, he, he identified with his people. And in mercy, they were indeed his people. And he looked after them just as he looked after the place where they lived. This was his home too, and he looked kindly on that place. It was dear to his heart because it was dear to his people's heart. But then, this people of Israel, with Jerusalem as its capital, you can imagine, they, went, they fell away from God. And thus their situation got, went from bad to worse, until in 586 BC, the Babylonians came from the northeast, <clears throat> from uh, Babylon, and they destroyed <clears throat> Jerusalem and everything in it, including the temple. And many Israelites, especially the leaders, were carried off into exile. And the ones who weren't leaders, they wouldn't know how to build anything like this either. They were pretty harmless, so we could just let them go. Now you might think, well, the city's level, the temple's gone. This is it for Jerusalem, isn't it? No, not so fast. You remember Ezra and Nehemiah? They are two books in the Old Testament, are they not? Through Ezra and the Nehemiah, the temple was rebuilt and the wall around the city was rebuilt. But you notice in that order, first the temple and then the wall. You wouldn't, wouldn't you expect they'd first build the wall so they could be protected enough to build the temple? No, they built the temple with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other, and after the temple was rebuilt, then they built the wall. Now this temple that was built was a mere shadow of what Solomon's was. It took the skeleton crew 70 years to build it, while most of the workers were still in exile. But this is not like Solomon's. 
And if I may give you an illustration of what this was like, it was smaller than the original temple, where the walls would have been marble. In this temple, it was particle board covered with wallpaper. And where the floors were solid granite, it would be linoleum. And the walls would be made not of stone, but of earth, and not 50 feet tall, but around 10 feet tall. But do you think God minded this? Not in the least. He lived in a t tent for years and years, and he didn't care. Uh, he didn't care because he loves his people, and he loves the place where they live, Jerusalem. That's his home, too. Then there is one last step in history, and you have to bear with me. We move forward now for 500 years. And it's at this time that this fellow comes on the scene. He's called King Herod. That should ring a bell to you. He was a, a, the king of a small land, Edomia, which is uh, apparently another name for Edom, the short version. And Herod is the one who had all the babies in Bethlehem under two years of age killed, remember? Because he was angry about the, this king of Israel being born. But Idumea, Edom, he wanted more than that, so Herod wanted more power, and here's what he did. He met with the Roman emperor at the time, and they became friends, and the emperor said, I tell you what, you can rule over Israel as long as you want, and you can rule over Jerusalem as long as you want. You can, if and only if, you can keep these Jews happy. They've been a thorn in my side ever since I came to this throne. And uh, you keep these Jews happy, and you keep them happy, especially in Jerusalem, and you can be king as long as you want. And so Herod said, hey, I know what I'll do. I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to build a new temple for the Jews. The one was held together by staples and rubber bands by this point. And I'm going to build them a huge temple. It is going to be totally impressive. And it'll be double the size of the original temple. And that way, the Jews will be happy. And if the Jews are happy, the emperor will be happy. And if the emperor is happy, well, goody, goody, I'll be happy too. So the Temple of Herod, <clears throat> the grandest of all, was built in Jerusalem. And this is the temple that was standing when Jesus went about in his ministry. And this is the one he always talked about. When out with all of this as background, we come to the story for today. The disciples went with Jesus into Herod's temple, and on their way out, way out you heard the, the words in the, uh, in the gospel lesson. Uh, the disciples were marveling, what beautiful stones, and what beautiful buildings. And Jesus said, oh yeah, the time is coming where there will, will be not one stone left upon another. See, what this could be referring to is that oftentimes the walls of the temple would be covered with gold leaf. And if a fire were started in, to, to try to destroy the building and so on, the gold leaf had a way of uh, uh, melting it and then uh, seeping into the cracks between the stones. And so if you were plundering the place and getting what you could get out of it, what was the only way where you could get all the gold out? You had to remove the stone to get at what was in the cracks. And thus, by the time they were done, there would not be one stone left upon another. Does that uh, sound familiar? And then Jesus gave a list of ugly things, and it's, it meant horrible things for the disciples, 
and for us and for everybody and for everything and so on. And you heard the list. False prophets will come. There'll be wars and rumors of wars, nations fighting against nations, earthquakes and famines, and those who believe in me will be persecuted. They'll be persecuted by secular councils, and they'll even be persecuted by religious leaders. And the strife will be so severe it can happen even in each family. Brother against brother, child against father, and vice versa. And everybody in this world is going to hate you because you believe in me. That's, that's really a terrible picture, but it still hasn't come to its worst ending. It came in 66 through 70 AD. They had enough trouble, but then the Romans came. They were fed up with Jerusalem, and they came with two of their seven divisions, just a little bit more than one quarter of Rome's military strength. And they destroyed Herod's temple too. And the temple was never rebuilt. And it never has been rebuilt. And the only thing that's left of that city is one retaining wall, which you may have heard of it called the Wailing Wall, where they mourn at the wall and they're mourning that they don't have the house of God anymore. In this siege by the Romans, it is estimated that one million people were killed, either by the sword or starving to death. And some of them, a handful of them, were able to escape to Masada, to the south, along the Dead Sea. But they died too. It was a terrible picture. But there are two things that I can just mention right now which changed this whole terrible picture. A terrible picture, but, but, Jesus says, this is why you want to preach the gospel, the good news to people everywhere. Tell them that I love you and I died for you and I will rescue you and I haven't changed a, a bit. And you tell these people, that I love them, and I died for them, and I will rescue them, and they will live forever. You get that message out. And you yourself, you hang in there in your faith. You're going to be all right. You're going to be safe. I will always love you, so you don't have to worry. And the church has huddled around that simple gospel promise centered in the, the cross and the empty tomb. We've huddled around it ever since in the midst of tragedies. One last thought about this, and that is, when Jesus said, I love you, to his people, he said, I love your home, too. I love Jerusalem to this day. In the years after the story, the Romans destroyed many uh, sacred sites to us. And the Muslims also destroyed sites because they didn't share everything about the Bible as we do. And in the 7th century, the Persians, of all people, tried to des destroy all Christian churches in the Promised Land. And they missed only one church, and that was the Church of the Nativity, which is still standing to this day. I know, I've walked through it. However, with all that destruction, there were coincidentally two pieces of Jerusalem that could never be destroyed, it seemed. And that was the Calvary of Jesus' crucifixion. Now, I have been to that uh, church that housed it, and there, it's, a, it's a covered over with a, a sheet of uh, Golgotha, that is, it's covered over with a sheet of, uh, of um, marble. But they left one little peephole like this. And uh, I don't know if the uh, guys like this, but I went through the ropes and I peeked in the hole. And you'll never guess what I saw. I saw the surface of Golgotha through that hole. 
And in the middle of that was something about eight inches square. And it was an in indented into the, uh, the surface of Golgotha. What do you suppose that might be? It's a place where the cross had been standing. And emanating out from that square was a crack because Jesus' death caused an earthquake which started with that crack right there. So the, uh, the, uh, the place of the crucifixion was saved and also the empty tomb actually housed in the same building. Now, there was, for many years after Bible times, to show that the feet, the feet will never, ever have permanent effects. There was a church called the Church of Holy Zion, and I saw where it used to be, at least. And the Zion being the place where God dwells. And there was a Christian church there, basically right across the street from the upper room in the house of Caiaphas, which are so familiar to you. And uh, I would estimate there are about a hundred and some people in that church, but I, I would estimate that 75% of these people had seen Jesus alive after Easter morning. And uh, so that church is still going, and there's huh, one church that's still going. It's the tallest tower in Jerusalem. And that tallest tower in Jerusalem is Redeemer Lutheran Church. There it is, standing right in the middle of the city. So that's it, but now I almost forgot something. No, I didn't forget, I'm just out of time. But uh, heaven, let's not forget heaven. What is heaven called in the Bible? Heaven is the new, Jerusalem. he still loves Jerusalem. He's making a special Jerusalem for us. Shaped like a cube, a perfect holy of holies where, where God dwells. And so he still loves the place where his people dwell. Read Revelation 21. You'll hear all about the heavenly new Jerusalem, which is there for anyone who believes. So read it and uh, just bear in mind, he loves you forever, and he loves the place where you will live forever as well. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.